So um, I haven't talked to Jens about the content of this talk, but see if you can spot any parallels. Uh, the, the thing is, you know, if you fast forward, you're going to see that most maintainers think alike because, you know, the process teaches you. Anyhow, so my name is Boris Petkov. I work for AMD and also uh, maintain parts of the kernel, parts of x86 and RAS and EDAC. And um, this is not my first time here. Last time I was here it was like eight, seven, eight years ago. And we were still at the Mozilla Foundation offices. And I did a technical talk about, <laughs> about x86 instructions encoding and Ann said I killed everybody. <laughs> she was very nice to formulate it in a, <laughs> in a very nice way, you know. So I thought maybe this time I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about uh, technical stuff because, you know, I mean, it's all documented, you can go read it. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, my experience as a maintainer. I've been maintaining for pretty much a decade now. And before that, I was a code submitter. And when I was a code submitter, I was wondering, well, why, why, are, the, why are those maintainers so grumpy and nasty all the time? <laughs> now I know. <laughs> and I was thinking maybe I can share my experience and um, maybe help people along the way, maybe to see it from the maintainer's point of view and maybe improve the process. You know. Anyhow. Yeah, the, the usual disclaimers. Uh, yeah, oh, this is my opinion. And it, it is an opinion, it's not the, the truth. And my opinion, not of my employers. And since we have uh, other maintainers in the public, I would, uh, in the audience, I would, I would hope if they, you know, give their opinions because maintainers have opinions. Right? <laughs> so that, it'll be fun, it'll be much more fun than me talking for, babbling for, you know, 40 minutes. And if you read LKML regularly, You've probably seen all this. You can, you can go out for a walk instead. Right, so yeah, this is the picture I sent for kernel recipes the last time, you know? This is probably 10 years ago. Look at this guy, you know, he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling, you know, no white hair. And this is the picture I sent this time. This is what kernel development, kernel maintainership does to you. I mean, you know. It, uh, other maintainers handle it very, very nicely, so this is a personal thing, you know. I'm not saying you should not become a maintainer, but, you know, sometimes you should be aware of what happens. Okay. So the development process we have in the kernel, I think it's a, a kind of a fence, you know. And... Uh, you have stuff flying over that fence. On one side, you have an ever-growing number of code submitters. Most of them are employed, so there's business interest to get stuff upstream. It wasn't like that before, a long time ago when I started. Most of us were students, you know, working in a free time or in the, in the break between the, the semesters. But now, almost everybody's employed. For example, <clears throat> A friend of mine, I was helping him out how to get involved in the kernel development. And his, he was doing um, computer science um, bachelors, but he wasn't done yet. So I showed him you know, the ropes. Here's how you do a patch. Here, here's what you pay attention to. And here's, here's how you send it. So he sent it. I applied it. The next week, he got two job offers. <laughs> and he wasn't even finished yet. So, yeah, you can safely assume everybody's employed working on the kernel. So there's business interest. And there's, that's the, the people we get to you know, work most of the time with. And there's users and testers. They report back. Jens explained what is a good bug report and what is a bad bug report. We would like to have you know, more testers. You know? We are not a, not a huge company with all kinds of machines in a fleet that we, you can run all the kernels, all the release candidates, all the trees, you know, and get reports back. So testers are very important. And if you want, want to get involved in the kernel development, you know, testing the kernel instead of sending cleanup patches is so much better. For example, 
if you report a bug in a maintainer or the person who's debugging it starts asking the right questions and asks you to try stuff, you get to learn how to apply a patch, how to test it, how to build a kernel and everything. So it's a deep dive into the kernel. And if you're considering doing that, that's a great idea. And it's, a, it's one way to get involved. I've done this myself 20 years ago, and I was, uh, it was uh, a really eye-opening experience. You know, Linus was debugging a, a suspend to, to disk issue with me, and it was, it was insane. It took us two weeks to debug it. Anyhow, so yeah, the other type, you have occasional experimenters, you know, you know, lurking around the LKML and saying, hey, maybe you should try this, maybe you should try that. Why don't you try it? I mean, you can learn something and you can save some, some maintainer time by saying, okay, here's what I, what, what I tried. I did it because of this and the results are that. Maybe at the end there's going to be a patch and you have learned st stuff and you have improved things. And, of course, the board Yahoo's, which is looking for someone to play with, they think, yeah, you know, people in LKML, they have all the time in the world. Oh, well. So, yeah, code submitters today, my experience, they flood maintainers' mailboxes. They hardly, if ever, help out review. So all these things here and all the, the, the official speech, that's me as an AI reading so many code submitters, mails, and this is me, my neural network generating what they would say. So you hear stuff like, Pete, where you, when will you look at my patches? What is taking you so long? I mean, it's a simple patch. I just flooded you in my patch set two days ago. Let me send it again. You know, there is a typo in, 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 in 35 patches patch set. Let me send it again. <laughs> I should build the patch? Nah. It's too, I'm too busy, and it's obvious. There's also a, a, the design thing. This is a more complicated issue. Like, why, what I notice is people don't spend enough time trying to understand how the feature they implement would integrate better into the existing subsystem or subsystems. You go and say, well, I have this you know, deadline. Or, I don't want to read about the subsystem, how this thing is designed, the high-level thing. I'm just going to go and bolt it on. And then, well, it works for me. Well, but then you shouldn't wonder why the maintainers are, you know, grumpy about this. Because they have to forward port it forever. Another thing I've experienced, you know, you, know, you review the patches at some point. They're good, more or less. And they get applied. And then, and, and then, you know, they, they hit the, the mainline trees and people start testing them. And somebody comes with a report and says, well, this doesn't work in my machine. And I'm like, well, I have all these thousand other patch sets that I need to deal with. Let me see, see the original author of the patches. See, maybe he knows what the problem is. Crickets. No reply. So we have to drop everything and go fix that situation. So yeah, maintainers get the mop up and forward port it. Which brings me to the other thing. Everybody go, goes like, well, my code must be upstream now. Like, now. And there's this, you know, there's a rush to get stuff upstream. And that makes, in my opinion, people do silly things. You know, like, send series untested. You know, you go and do a last minute change or you, you integrate all the review feedback, but you don't build it and test it again because, hey, the maintainer is looking at my code now, so let me send it immediately. And then, then it doesn't even build. And that's a great idea. You have review feedback that gets ignored. You know, somebody sits down and reviews your code and says, you should do this, you should do that, blah, blah. And you get the, ne the next submission. None of that, or some of that feedback has not been you know, at least replied to, to say, well, maybe that's a great idea, but I think A and B. Or, I agree with your feedback. I'm going to incorporate it in my next review. So you go and, 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 and 
I always look at the previous reviews I've done because pretty much most of the time stuff gets ignored. I used to, you know, copy paste the feedback from the previous mail and say you, you missed that. Now I'm just saying, well, you haven't took the time, taken the time to, 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 to read my feedback. I'm not going to read your pet set again because there's enough other pet sets. And I really think that git send email should have a timeout. You know, Lord Colonel Work actually traces, has all the all the patch sets, all the submissions. Git send email should connect to that and say, well, when was the last time you sent it? You know, not yet. So yeah, th this this rush thing is causing more frustration than than necessary. So I don't think you want to rush your stuff upstream. Seriously, you don't want to do that. If your manager rushes you, then he doesn't have any idea how the process works. Maybe he should read documentation process. That's all there. Because what do you think happens when you go upstream? Stuff is done, and then that's not my problem anymore? That's a maintenance problem now? Do you think that people jump on it immediately? Well, I don't think so. Usually the distros they would go and look at the features that go upstream and, and, and they say, well, do we have a use case for that? Do we have a, I don't know, do we have a customer that's going to use that? And then if they have a customer, they go and say, well, what's it going to take to backport that stuff? Because distros don't use it upstream Linux. They use some backported old kernels called Frankenstein kernels. So, and, and, and the cloud vendors is similar. You know, they use some old kernel. They actually patched so that it does whatever they want to do. They have to backport it. So it's not like you need to get your code upstream now. You can get it upstream in two, in two months. But test it right, fix everything, address all feedback, and everything's going to be great. And you can save yourself all that trouble. So. The fence, remember, on the other side, the maintainers, they still cannot scale. I mean, years ago, maintainers would, they were, there was one person maintainer per subsystem, more or less. And there was a talk about maintainers not, not, not scaling because of the workload. They still cannot scale. You know, like Jens said, and this is it, every time you open your email, there's always stuff. There's always something. There's no break. So the workload grows and grows. And most, most active subsystems, they have a maintainer groups. Like TIP has maintainer groups. I'm part of that group. And it still doesn't, doesn't scale. Still, still a lot of work. We have five or six people. And they're all busy all the time, nonstop. Because you have to do bug fixes. And it's not like, it's not like there's a bug and you have to ignore it for, I don't know, a couple of weeks and concentrate on review. No, no, you drop everything and you take care of the bug first because I, I don't have to explain it. You know, Linux needs to work perfectly. That's it. So you do that, then you have to do code integration. Like, for example, I don't know how other subsystems do it. Like, TIP has topic branches, meaning Every patch that belongs to a topic goes to a certain branch, like MM or memory encryption or boot or CPU, whatever. So at some point, and we do that a couple of times a week, you go and merge all these branches together into a common branch that's called tip master. And that thing goes into Linux next. And, and this is, I mean, most of the time it works, there's a script, but sometimes there are merge conflicts. So you have to pay attention to that. You need to work on that. You need to test that tree because you don't want to you know, send an untested you know, branch into, into Linux Next and break, break everybody who's actually bold enough to try Linux Next first. So that's, that takes time. Then you have to do new features review. I mean, the obvious thing. Oh, and by the way, all the maintainers work. They, you know, they're employed. You know, they have to pay for the bread. You know, so they have to work for that. And, and, and because, because all this stuff is not enough, this is a recent thing since, I don't know, 2017 or something, embargoed hardware issues. 
and Greg is laughing because these things, you know, you know, we don't have enough work to do. So, you know, there's researchers and they love how CPUs speculate and try to, try to, I don't know, bring, bring those CPUs to execute spe code speculatively and then leak secrets. So when something like that happens, and that happens on a regular basis since 2017, you need to drop everything, or maybe most, most of the stuff, and then you go on an encrypted mailing list and talk to the people who actually are involved in the development of the fix of the bug and fix it. And you have to agree with the bug reporters on a release disclosure date. Then you, on the disclosure date, you send the fixes to Linus, he merges them, Greg backports them, and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> because we haven't had the time to test those fixes in all the, in all the infrastructure, in all the testing infrastructure we have. Uh, with the last one, the, it would even break you know, builds with, with uh, Clang. So you have to drop everything, you, take, you know, collect all the fixes, and then you get back to your normal work. So yeah, it's insane for maintainers. So yeah, there's this strange symbiosis, and there's the fans, and stuff is flying back and forth constantly. And maintainers sometimes don't even have the time to catch it in flight, they like to, you know, to give their opinion maybe to, before it goes upstream. Sometimes they even have to scrape it off the wall and go and fix it while it's in the, after it's, it, it has landed upstream. And that's a lot more, a lot more involved. And it never ends and it never stops. And yeah, because you know, it doesn't get, you know, it's a lot of fun already. So we add the hardware, the hardware vendors to the symbiosis because you know, most of the people, oh, okay, some of the people are employed by hardware vendors. And hardware vendors, they want to have their hardware enabled to work in Linux. So they, they have developers. And their way of thinking, at least it used to be that, is, well, it's only software, right? We're gonna, we're gonna get together, just architects, and design this crazy new feature, you know, in a hidden room somewhere, and not tell anyone about it. Then we're gonna put it in silicon, and the thing is gonna come out three, four, five years later, and you're gonna put this silicon in front of the, the maintainer and say, you need to support that. Uh, but, but, but that doesn't make any sense. Well, we put it in silicon, we, we, and we, we um, invested in it $100 million. What are you going to do about it? Well, then we have to support it, right? And we can, yeah, we can build your house of cards, but then what happens if we, if we, have, to, if we have to change stuff, you know, in another subsystem or, or below the subsystem this, this new feature uses? Or we need to change, you know, the whole kernel. Supporting a feature like that, which, which is completely non-optimal, is always a problem. And uh, this has happened a couple of times where Linux has actually said no to supporting hardware features. And hardware guys they went back and did it right. And Linux has this weight in the meantime that I can say that. But the good thing is, this is not the case anymore. I mean, it, it gets better. Most of the vendors have Linux developers, and they get to look at the new feature designs and give their opinion and say, this doesn't make sense. You should improve it this way. This completely doesn't make sense. You should throw it in the garbage and not, 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 not uh, invest so much money in implementing that. So this, this gets better. So yeah, I think the, the, the symbiosis we have right, right now is, is non, not sustainable. There's, a, there's a, at least you know, for the tip tree, there's a huge backlog of patches to review. There are ever-growing to-do lists, and they seldom get addressed. They more likely become obsolete in the sense that 
they expire. You know, the hardware expires. You, everybody throws it away because you know, 10 years have passed. And you can throw away your to-do items too. There's barely time for refactoring and cleanups, which is very important. Very, very important. And it's a life-saving task. So yeah, maintainers are not born grumpy. They become grumpy after dealing with all that. So what's the fix? To make you all reviewers and maintainers too. <laughs> what do I mean by that? So if code submitters try walking maintainer shoes, then the process, I think, would be a lot smoother. Maybe they become maintainers themselves. And not even that is absolutely necessary. It's enough if code submitters try to share some of the maintainers' work might help them understand why maintainers say no and why they're grumpy most of the time. And maybe it might improve their code submission, their code when they submit it, because they actually seen the process from the other side. Because the development process, what it should be, is the long-term prosperity of the kernel, I think is the main goal of this. It's not like you should come here, drop your feature, and disappear, and think everything's great, because the people who are left after you, they need to deal with that forever. And the source code needs to remain maintainable. It's not like I'm going to put this here and that here. Yeah. The design needs to be clean. Uh, Paul wants to say something. You know, if worst comes to worst, if worst comes to worst, and you're you disappear, you got a feature in RCU, I have a simple patch that can solve that problem. Yeah, I mean, that's another way to fix it, right? Cut it off. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, we don't, want, we, we don't want that, right? We want support. Right, but, yeah, exactly. But, but Absolutely. I mean, at some point, if you cannot support something as a maintainer and don't have the time for it, just disable it or remove it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Getting it upstream at any cost is just not that simple. Uh, hello. Um, I don't know about disabling is um, the proper way. There's a nice email thread going on at this very moment. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, about disabling of uh, old um, file systems. I'm sure Willie could talk about this too. <laughs> but yeah, does, I don't think just disabling is a question because we have this you know, no regressions things you do. Yeah. So sometimes you're stuck with it, and you've got to find a way. I, good, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, how do you, how do you deal with, with that? Well, there, there's, the thing is, if uh, people are complaining they want it, you know, then if I say, I'm sorry, I'm not dealing with it anymore, you want it, great, here's the code. I just removed it. You can make patches, and you can support it. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, you're right. That's vicious, and it doesn't work all the time. But that, if, that is the uh, ultimate fallback position. It matters what the code is because like maybe in your case with RCU, that's mostly internal. Uh, things may not behave the same or you might have to do something weird or something. But once you have a user facing like feature that requires this and you do an enhancement that this user facing feature requires and there's tools that depend on it and you say and then you know something happens, you're right. It's like we say, well, find someone to support it. But if the, some, someone disappears, the guy who originally did it and knew all the code and disappears, and then there's this whole user base that's using it and they don't know how to code. Coding can be learned. <laughs> well, what happens in reality most of the time is you end up maintaining it. I mean, you have to, right? And yeah, so you get more work. Um, I agree with you, yeah. but uh, putting the other alternative, you know, okay, you cut and run, we're going to cut and run your code, is important to set expectations and to adjust attitudes, in my yep. opinion, yep. regardless of whether it's actually practical in a particular position, yep. situation. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, refactoring and um, redesign is very important. Oh, somebody. Um, one question. You mentioned uh, walking in the maintainer's shoes for the submitters. Uh, some projects exercise um, uh, some sort of due diligence or at least a requirement where people submitting a patch are then required to review at least one patch from somebody else. 
uh, for some projects, it seems to work. It's probably unworkable for uh, the kernel, but uh, what are your thoughts about this? I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's good. There's, I think, also a certain amount of gaming on some of that. I'll see somebody from Company X write the patch, and another guy from Company X comes in and be going like, yeah, this looks awesome, right? <laughs> I have seen like, that oh, too. Now it's all reviewed, and right? it's good to go in. But it, you know, yeah. But yeah, I'd love to have a scoring system. Yeah. Right? Review three patches, you get one in. And, and there, there's also a review and review, you know, and that's not a problem. Willie. Uh, so yeah, I mean, reviewing review patch, you get one in. Yeah, that kind of sounds good. But sometimes, like, I'm doing. 100 patch series that touch eight different parts of the kernel, do I have to go and review a patch in each of those eight systems? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the really answer was so yes. It's painful. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah, we, we'll get to review. That comes la later. So yeah, basically applying sane thinking when, when designing, when, when working on a kernel, anything, you know? It's not about dropping it and disappearing, but it's about, you know, long term. So all contributors and maintainers, I think, should pursue the same goals. So how can you make the maintainer's life easier? You send your patches, the maintainers are busy, you know, as always, and you're wondering what to do. So while waiting for your review, you review. Seriously, I mean it. If you don't review, and you don't have time or whatever, test Linux next. You know, that's, that's, it would be amazing if we could catch as many bugs as possible before they go upstream, because it's a lot harder to fix stuff after that. Look at a bug report or three, you know, or show compassion, you know. Maintainers are just like normal people. So, you know, they have to work all the time. So when we, call, when we come to the topic of code review, I think is without a doubt the most unthankful and at the same time the most important work to do in the kernel. Getting good review is priceless and should be appreciated. That's why when you get a review, you should at least reply to that review and say, I agree with your comments or I don't agree because and explain, give a good argument, technical argument, explaining why you don't agree. But ignoring review is a very nasty thing to do. And, and maintainers notice that. So if you want to, you know, if you're bored, find an interesting patch set on LKML, and there are so many patches, patch sets. Just review one, you know, look at it, and try to think as a maintainer. Like, does this code make sense? If this were my kernel, would I accept it? And would I support it for a million years? I think that will help a lot. Dave Hansen has done this already. Things are a bit busy in the review queue in the moment. As always, we'd love help reviewing stuff. So why are you waiting for us to review this? Could you perhaps look around and find a series that's also hurting for review tax. That'll be very, very helpful. You know, all the code submitters, they, they know, they, they, I hope they know the area they send code for. So maybe they can find a similar, you know, patch or patch set that touches this area and they can look at it, try to understand it. Does it make sense? From, you know, from design point of view and this, how does it work with my changes? Just ask questions. That's enough. Ask questions. And yeah, sometimes I notice, you know, people are annoyed by maintainers being, you know, complaining about every minor thing, uh, nitpicking even. And to the unenlightened, it might sound, it might, it, 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 yeah, it could sound too picky. Maybe it's too much. But there's a deep and sensible reason. And let me explain first what maintainers complain about. And then maybe, maybe it, could, 
it could get more, it could get clearer. Right, commit title. Commit title, we want, in a tip tree at least, we want to commit title to have certain format, like subsystem and component, and then there's a concise commit title that summarizes the patch, the patch, what the patch does in imperative tone. If you don't know what, what a good example is, you just do git log and then put the file name that your one of the file names your patch touches and look at the look at the examples. Some most of them are good examples. Why is this important? The uniformity thing. Like when you deal with a lot of commits, like you know, the example I gave before, the tip tree, different topic branches, when you start doing patch tetris, you know, merging together, and you look at the single patch name, if you see five patches that say x86 fix build issue, you don't know, you have to go look at every patch and see what, what's going on here. Like, what is this fixing? Which fix is that? Does it need to go to stable? If the commit title is enough self-explanatory that you actually know what's going on, then you don't have to, you can save yourself all that time and you know what's going on. So, in other words, the longer a maintainer deals with style and with stuff like that, the less time there is for actual review and other work. The commit message, this, this came up today, and I think the commit message is very, very important. It should be written by humans and for humans. It should definitely not be right only. I have seen commit messages like that. There is a bunch of gibberish. It doesn't mean anything. And if you try to read it, you know, weeks, months from now, you have no clue what's going on. So I think you should try to write, to write it as clear, as understandable as possible. You don't have to be a native speaker of English. Even the native speakers do lousy jobs sometimes. The clarity is the main goal here. And the maintainers with fixed up style issues, they always do that. But you should try to do so genuinely. A couple of observations I've done with commit messages, too laconic, like, you have been working on a bug for, I don't know, a lot of weeks, and everything is in your head. You know exactly what the situation is, all the aspects, how it happens. And it's, I mean, it's obvious, it's right there. You know, I'm just gonna put one sentence. Fix, blah, or whatever. And you completely leave out the context pre preparation. Now imagine yourself looking at this years from now. I mean, you've moved on, you, look, you hack on something else, and you go and say, fix, blah. Go look at, oh my, what was that about? And then you start remembering, trying to remember. I mean, a lot of times I have seen it with myself and other maintainers, they don't remember anymore. It is too much. You cannot just remember every aspect. So you should always keep Git archaeology in mind. You should leave enough breadcrumbs in comments and in the commit message so that you know what you were fixing and why. And why this is very important for maintainers, maintainers do git archaeology on a pretty much daily basis. Example, somebody sent you a fix and they do, and the fix does this and that. And then you go and look like, okay, what was, why was it done this way in the first place? You go look at the git archaeology and then you start searching for stuff and then you find a commit, and it's a huge commit from 2001 that says, add support for blah. Great. Now, now you don't have any clue why this was added, why was it done this way, and, and, and so on. So it would be much better to, to leave breadcrumbs. Stephen. Hello? OK. Um, very good, and by very good things. And one thing I want to kind of stress, too, that since we brought up removing code, um, I've actually was, thank God myself from years ago, there was some code in uh, my, that I was looking at and saying, well, I want to delete this, but I'm like, well, what ripple effect will I have or why, it, why did I do it this way? And I actually looked at the change log and I actually wrote why I did it the way it was and then went back and looked and said, oh, that's no longer applicable and made it possible to delete this code without worrying that I'm going to cause a regression. So that's another thing that's very useful. Exactly. One of the examples I had, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just 
just write down, maybe do a, I don't know, a small brain dump or, of what was the situation when you wrote the fix you know, or, or the patch set. You know, the kernel didn't support that, so I had to do it this way. Or there was BIOS broken or whatever. So that it is clear why, why it was done, you know. We, we argue about these things and I always ask people to document what they're doing and they always go like, uh, why, why should I do it? Well, because stuff like that. Yeah. And it's not all, uh, only for the others. It's sometimes, of, um, sometimes also for the future you. Sometimes uh, when I'm reading back my commit message from two or three years ago, I'm happy to find myself telling to myself today that uh, why I did this change. And it's very valuable even for yourself to yeah. do it. Yeah, exactly. So I wonder if there's like some kinds of code that maybe there should be some list, like if you use this kind of code, you should document it. So like uh, I find myself looking at locks and then I don't know why this lock is here or what this lock is protecting. Yeah. And then I go back in the history and I see what introduced it and it's like they introduced 10 functions so they don't talk about this lock because yeah. they didn't feel like that was the important thing. Yeah. We, we documented in our tip maintainer tree that every lock needs to have an explanation why it's there because things change, you know. You change the interface, you change the API, and the lock is still there, and maybe it, it doesn't make sense anymore, but yeah. Yeah, so one thing which I also want to remark is often uh, I'm at least in invo involved in workarounds for firmware issues or whatever, SPI table stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's something in that area, please also, the commit message really should also uh, list like the model of the laptop or whatever where the, the quirk is done. Yeah. So that if you later you want to get rid of the quirk because you think you have a more generic fix, you know I need to test on this laptop to confirm yeah. that. Yeah. Basically, you want to have all the required informational ingredients so that you know how this bug came about. Exactly. Um, Erwan mentioned that uh, you need to, f to think like you're speaking to the future yourself. Uh, and uh, in fact, I tend to apply this a lot and suggest uh, that when there are multiple solutions to a problem and you have to pick one, it's important to put notes in the commit message about the other ones, because sometimes uh, you will figure maybe one year later that it was not that good an idea or you, you come to a dead end. <laughs> And uh, then it's possible to restart from the other alternatives. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, you, you should write down, like, we thought about this solution first, but the problem was blah. And it doesn't make sense to do it this way. So we decided to do it that way, but then that broke. And then we ended up doing it this way. And if you, if you have that in a commit message, that, that's going to be priceless. You know, it's just perfect. Um, one other question about the interaction between comments and commit messages. Sometimes it makes more sense to have a comment explaining uh, why you're doing something. The, I think the commit message is more about why there's the change and the comment probably more about why the code is there in the first place. Um, what are your suggestions how to um, move text between commit messages and comments? This is why I have this this point why most maintainers frown upon white space and check patch whole file cleanups. Like you start doing Git archaeology and then you look at the line that's 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 important and you do Git annotate and then look at the SHA one and it's like yeah, clean up white space. Oh, great. So you do Git annotate SHA one till the one so the one before it. Then you look at the file again and you keep looking looking until until you find a real change. So yeah, I mean, having stuff in comments is better because it's right there, you know? You don't have to do Git archaeology. If it's really important, I would put it in both. I mean, the comment should be s smaller, conciser, but the commit message could go, you know, go in more detail. Thomas has a, at, at the back. Yeah, yeah, but I was actually waiting for him. I was, after, I was saying after him before. Actually, I had my hand up and he got it in front of me. <laughs> so real, real quick, just to, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm not going to go about the comment thing, because like documenting locks, that should be in comments if you really think. But no, I want to go back for a step you said before about uh, previous having multiple different theory or different uh, things. Uh, one thing that's really, really good in um, uh, commit messages now, link to a lore email thread. Please add link uh, links to Lord. Yes. Uh, Lore is the arc, um, archive of the Linux kernel mailing list, and if there's ever a good discussions, add them to your commit messages. 
Um, very much so. And also, oh, yeah, right there. So really put that in. And also, if you, what I also try to do, I wish I made this, everyone would do this. When you do a V2 and you do the changes since V1, include the lore link to the V1. So, because your, your lore link will usually go back to the, your, where you submitted it, but if there's like V12 and you want to look at the other 11 versions, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to find them. Ready? Yeah. Thomas. <laughs> Uh, coming back to that uh, comment versus commit uh, message, please put the reasoning into the commit message first because that's how we read patches. We don't start at the bottom at the, at the comment. We read the explanation first. So you set the, the, the scenery for, for a reviewer to say, hey, this is the context. This is failing. This is what I did, and I came up to the conclusion to make this so complicated that I need this lengthy ex explanation. Then I have a totally different uh, view going down into the patch and actually looking whether this makes sense in context of the code, but you set the scenery already. If you just say, hey, this is fixing the bug and blah, 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 with mostly zero content, and then I read this, uh, patch with this huge comment into you and say, why didn't you explain me at least at the conceptual level what you're trying to do? So this, this is just for effectiveness. I mean, I, I fundamentally hate bad commitment messages because they make my life harder. Especially those which leave out context. They just say, hey, we fixed this. Uh, but they do not even explain what the problem is or in which context the problem uh, uh, shows up. Because for them it's obvious with their particular test case, but I don't know what the problem is. So this is just enough, in, give, give the, the other side enough information to understand what you're trying to do and why. So the what is mostly the patch itself, but if it's it's really a complex uh, uh, fix where you have to do nasty things, explaining it in the commit message, even for the Git archaeology thing uh, and for the maintainer's sake or the reviewer's sake is very, very useful. But then please write short, technically concise sentences. And the last one, Yes, I totally agree with Boris Love. There's a tendency because we, we request uh, explicit change logs, so people start to write novels, uh, but they started um, here and 500 words later ends the first sentence. And it's words a lot. They, n n no, structure it in smaller sentences, make paragraphs, there's new lines for a reason and things like that. Uh, one trick I use occasionally if I know the submitter's native language, and I, sometimes they do the same thing I would do, right? Uh, they use their native language's grammar and English words. And if the language is fairly close to English, that's fine, but sometimes it gets hard. Uh, Google translated back to their native language and then back to English. Sometimes that improves it quite a bit. <laughs> it's a cute trick. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would um, you know, fix such commit messages and then if you look at those and, and then just make a note, you know, make them simpler next time. That, and at some point you know how to do it. Okay. A fun sign of a good commit message is when it makes you go back and actually change the code because you're kind of explaining what you're doing from first principles and realize, yeah. oh wait, I don't actually know that part's true. I'm gonna go and remove that bit from the code because it turns out it's not actually relevant to yeah. the fix in the end or. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly the thing when you have to explain somebody what you're trying to do and while explaining it, you, know, you realize, oh, okay, wait a minute. I can... Right, so the, the idea is you need to sell your change. You need to give enough information to the other party. It doesn't have to be the maintainer. You need to explain, this is why I'm doing this. And give all the required information so that the maintainer can go and say, okay, okay, that makes sense. Or, then he, or he can go and she can go and say, 
oh, maybe you can do it better in this way. You know, just lay it out. Don't be afraid. The contents is also very important. Just, you know, what Willie said, try to explain it to your future self. You're going to be reading this months, years from now. Are you explaining it with enough detail and with enough information that you can understand it again? Is everything in there? Explain the why of a patch and not the what. I mean, I'm writing this multiple times a day, every day. You know, the, you can see the what. It's in the diff, right? But why you're doing something, it's not always clear to maintain it. Because, you know, people look at a lot of code, a lot of patches. You, don't, you cannot just do the context switch in your mind so quickly understand, okay, this is, what, this is why, why he's doing it or she's doing it. And also explain the non-obvious aspects of your change. You know, stuff you spend, I don't know, weeks or maybe days thinking about. You should put that in the commit message. What, is, what are the things that one should pay attention to when somebody touches that code later? Because, you know, the kernel is not developed by one person. People come and go. It should be great if the people who come can look at the code of people who've gone and then continue improving it. Another fun one, we in the commit messages. People always complain about why we complain about the we. Well, who's we? We, the company you work for? We, the kernel community? Basically, remove all these, you know, formulations that get in the way of explaining the issue and use simple, impartial formulations for maximal clarity. That's the most important thing. And everybody will be thankful for that. So how do you do one commit message? This is one way to do it. It, do it doesn't have to be the only way. There are multiple ways. But basically, you start and prepare the context. Say, this is the the thing I'm talking about. Like, there's this fancy kernel thing and does blah. Another, another thing I notice, like there are abbreviations and concepts that, that are just used without explaining them, but not everyone is in your head, you know? You should just explain the things first, declare the variables, and then use them. And then you explain the problem. So there's this thing, but there's a problem with this thing when it does foo. And you also explain why this thing happens. Like, I'm trying to do bar, and then it doesn't work as expected. You should always aim at explaining how the bug happens, because when, some, when, when you do this Git archaeology thing I'll be talking about, in the future, you see at a bug fix, you look at a bug fix and say, this bug was triggering when you do this and that. And then you try to debug an issue that points to the same code and there are similarities. So it would be good to, to know what was back then the problem and then you try to analyze. Maybe that will help with analyzing your current problem. Maybe they're related. Maybe it's the same thing, you know, happening with a different firmware or whatever. And then you say fix the issue by doing X. You don't have to explain, you know, I'm adding this function, blah, blah, that's obvious. But, you know, do this. And you also can do why, which is, you know, related minor things. This is, goes back to the issue with, you know, doing white space cleanup. You don't have to do white space cleanup on whole, on whole files or just because of the changes. Do the white space cleanup when you touch the code. And then everything is in one patch. You know, it's that it's obvious. Then you, you know, you have less Git commits to go to when you do archaeology, and and it doesn't get in the way. So put everything which doesn't warrant, doesn't need to be in a separate patch. Put it in the same patch, and if in doubt, there, that's also documented. Everything I'm talking about is documented. It's part of submitting patches. <laughs> Okay. Okay, this one more, and then then we're done. Yeah, we, this this came up uh, after the commit message co comes the tags. The tags are 
important patch management tools which we use to know, for example, there's the fixes tag, which points to a git commit from the past. And if your patch that has the fixes tag fixes an issue that a previous commit introduced, then you put the previous commits SHA1 and commit title into the fixes tag. Why? Because a lot of trees, like subsystem uh, uh, distro trees, or all kinds of you know, trees that are downstream, use those fixes tag, tags to know, do I contain the broken patch? If I do, then I'm going to backport the fix too. And it makes it a lot easier to use, you know, to, to have a fixes stack and do that. For example, uh, SUSE does that. There's a, there's a bunch of scripts and a tool that actually does automatic tracking and selection of those patches. Like when upstream, uh, upstream kernel releases, then it looks which, which patches are in our distro trees and then those have fixes, and maybe you should backport those two. Then comes the sign of by chain. The sign of by chain roughly means a traceable path from the patch's origin to its final resting place. And a lot of code submitters don't know that. And it's also documented. You know, the sign of by chain doesn't mean he worked on the patch too. Or he added, he did a, I don't know, a, a suggestion, an improvement. The sign of by means the author, the first sign of by is the author. Then the second one is the one who handled the patch, a, a maintainer. The, ne the next one is another maintainer, maybe. And the last one is the one who committed. For example, if you want to express authorship, that's also documented. That's called co-developed by. That also comes with a sign of by, but both tags go together. But these are details. It's all written, you know. And this thing came up. Uh, the link link is a, another tag that points to the lore URL that has the most, hopefully, has the most relevant discussion about the issue so that whenever you do Git archaeology, you can go back and look at the whole thread, why, why it, was, it was designed this way. So I think we are out of time. Any more questions? Willie? Uh, so you said you are looking for more maintainers. I, I'm not sure you will get them uh, very quickly after your presentation. <laughs> Probably you will uh, get at least uh, better uh, contributions. Uh, one thing I noticed, uh, and not just in Linux, in other projects as well, is that, um, in fact, it was even the genesis of uh, kernel recipes. It's that uh, contributors uh, see maintainers like uh, gods or special people or whatever, and they don't realize that, in fact, yeah. sometimes they know even less than themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something very important. Yeah. And I don't know how it is possible to explain this once yeah. for all. Because they, they imagine that when they send a patch with, like you said, lots of acronyms or abbreviations or whatever, uh, the person in front of them uh, has uh, maybe a 30 extra point of IQ and uh, will understand everything, which is not necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, and quite frankly, I think it is a big problem because you said there, were, there was a fence, uh, there is a fence between the contributor and the maintainer, and I think that part of this fence is here. And when, for example, you expect some contributors to perform some testing on other patches or review or whatever, they don't feel legitimate on this task because yeah. they consider that they do not have the skills or the background or whatever, and uh, maybe uh, it's not their job to do it. It's not just that they don't have time, but maybe they don't feel legitimate at all. Yeah. And that's something which needs to be clearly yeah. improved. Yeah, Th there shouldn't be a fence, first, first thing. The second thing, yeah, I, I hear this, I've hear, heard this a bunch of times. People are afraid to send a patch because they might make a mistake. But everyone makes mistakes. Everyone. Everyone I know, all the maintainers I work with, everybody you can think of, they've made mistakes, silly mistakes. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is to be there to fix it. Yeah. That's it. 
People shouldn't be afraid to send patches. Nobody laughs at you. In fact, I look more at the intent in the commit message than at the, the diff itself, because I consider that a bad intent is difficult to fix, while a bug, a typo, or whatever in the code is easy to fix later. So, yeah. so we don't care that much. Yeah. And one barrier to the, um, the testing, in my opinion, because you expressed this, uh, this lack of test, uh, it's probably because uh, Linux uh, supports hardware much better nowadays. 20 years ago, uh, half of a laptop used to work well, to be honest. Uh, nowadays, everything works well. So in the past, there was a lot of uh, willingness for people to, uh, to engage in this, because when your CD driver or uh, touchpad or uh, uh, SD card reader or whatever did not work, uh, you could gain something, a new feature, just by testing a patch, because you, it, it could improve your, uh, your use case, your experience. Yep. Nowadays, everything works well, so I think there is l a lot less motivation to, to test patches. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is true. Thanks for the talk, Boris. Uh, really, really quickly, it's, it, I promise it's a question. Um, it's a bit of a gloomy picture you paint, so do you enjoy being a maintainer? And if so, how do you keep it enjoyable? Do, do I enjoy what? Do you enjoy being a maintainer? <laughs> and how do you keep it enjoyable if you do? I go for a run. <laughs> okay, we need to stop. Oh, but we can continue. <laughs> <laughs>